So, uh, homo, homo sapien, that's the definition of the species. The argument is that homo fictus, fiction man, story man, that might be an even better definition. Oh, I see, you're translating. This is why, okay, I see, I see. I thought she was insulting your language skills and you're just not going to be able to keep up. Um, let me give you a sense for what I'm talking about. It's the 1940s and there's these two psychologists named Heider and Simmel. And they create this very short, very crude animated film and they show it to 120 people. Uh, this is the film right here. At the end of the film, they just asked them a very simple question. What did you see? And I'm going to be quiet here and let you guys watch the end of this. And at the end, I'm going to ask you guys what you saw. I'm going to try to replicate this famous experiment. Now, let's see quickly if we can uh, replicate this experiment. So, what did you see is the question. And for, just a show of hands to start with, who sees some sort of story when they watch this little video? Yeah, so everybody sees some sort of story. And you can see the moment that it occurs. There's a moment in the room where the sort of confusion gives way to smiles and people sort of laugh a little bit as the story starts to really uh, shape, take shape in the mind. Now, very quickly, I'm going to look for one to two sentence responses. Would some brave volunteer tell me what story they saw? Like just a very quick one or two sentence plot summary of the story that you saw. Anybody willing to volunteer? Yeah, sure. There was a big uh, triangle uh, chasing a small triangle in a little circle, and, but they uh, were smarter than him and could escape. Okay, so sort of uh, the, the little guys outsmarting the the bully almost. Uh, anybody have a different story? Anybody see something different? Anybody see a uh, love triangle story? This is a very common response, the love triangle story. Uh, that's what my daughter Abby saw too. That's Abby over here. Um, anyone see a story? Uh, oftentimes there's a sort of domestic violence story. Um, uh, women in particular, I think, tend to see this. I, I call this the bad daddy story where the big triangle is bullying uh, his family and trying to split them apart and uh, then they escape. Also, anyway, we've, we've successfully replicated the experiment already. I love this experiment because it reveals us, human beings, as natural interpreters and creators of stories. So, it's not just that all of you would be capable, if I challenged you, to turn all of those raw and crude geometrical cues into this confident story. It's that you can't not do it. You can't not do it. You can't help yourself. Your mind will do it automatically, reflexively, without even trying. It's how your mind works as a storytelling animal. And I think it's important, by the way, that we're not all seeing the same story. And quite beautiful that we're not all seeing the same story. If we're all seeing the same story, that means that you're just really good at digesting a narrative that these two psychologists are feeding to you. The fact that we're seeing different stories means that when you watch this video, you are not experiencing a fiction. You're not enjoying a story. It is your brain that is authoring the fiction. It is creating the fiction. And again, automatically, reflexively, on the fly, without even trying, you can't help it. Now the point here, I hope is clear, has nothing to do 
with how your mind happens to respond to simple animation. That's not the point. The point is that this is what you're doing all the time. Every day of your life as a storytelling animal. We are constantly trying to impose this meaningful and comforting order of story structure on all the chaos of our existence. Can we save questions to the end? Okay. Um, the human mind is a wanderer by nature. So in normal waking life, the scientists tell us, we have about 100 daydreams per waking hour, 100 of them. That means that our minds are just fluttering all over the place all the time. But when you go into a story that you like, when you are watching your favorite show or reading some novel that you can't put down, you experience approximately zero daydreams per waking hour. Your hyperactive mind goes utterly still and it'll pay rapt attention, oftentimes for hours on end. There's nothing else in human life that has anything like that sort of cognitive effect. I think this is kind of impressive. To me, it means story is like a drug. It's a drug that reliably will lull us into what is an authentically altered state of consciousness. This is a state of consciousness typified by high rapt attention, and it's also typified by high suggestibility. People are more open-minded when they're in storyland, uh, or look at it from the other way, and they're a little more gullible, a little more credulous. Uh, there's some neuroscience that sheds some light on this. You can take people now, you slide them into fMRI machines, and the machines can read the brain while the brain is reading a story. They can watch it while it's watching a story. And if you do this, you find something fairly interesting. It's that the brain doesn't look like a passive spectator of the action. It looks more like an active participant. So if Clint Eastwood or somebody like that is up on the screen and he's angry, your brain looks angry too. And if the scene is sad, your brain looks sad. This is important. It does not look like you are sitting back passively and watching someone else have these experiences and have these emotions. It looks like you are the one who is going through these events. A video clip to illustrate. Did you hear that? What the heck? Did you hear that? Did you hear that? I said so. There's something in here with this guy. October 21st. That's pretty amazing, I think. I, I think we've lost track. This is so familiar to us, this kind of response, that we've lost track of how utterly bizarre that is. Right? This, these people are experienced moviegoers. They know that everything they are seeing is fake. Right? Uh, that blood isn't real. Those monsters aren't real. But not only are they treating these fake things as real, they are treating these fake things in these fake events as though they're happening to them. They're not acting like passive spectators, they're acting like they're in the movie. Why else would they be doing those little you know, dances in their seat? They're like, they're avoiding the danger. They scream for help. I like this moment, I don't know if you guys noticed it at the end of the trailer, where the whole audience practically, in unison, tuck in their elbows and draw up their knees. What are they doing there? They are, they're balling up to protect their vital organs. Amazing. And so their brains are telling their bodies to do all the things that they would do if they were actually under mortal attack. And so I think there's a lesson here for us. It's that stories are so powerful for us, at least in part, because at a brain level, whatever's happening on the page of your story or the stage or the screen is not just happening to them. It's not just happening to the characters. It's happening to us as well. So we know the film may be fake, but that doesn't stop dark, unconscious parts of our brain from processing it like real.
But what are these stories doing to our minds while they hold us in their trance? And it turns out they're doing quite a lot. So this guy is uh, Tolstoy, uh, one of the greatest of all the great storytelling animals. Um, and he's also, though, a really wonderful and adventurous philosophical thinker. And in 1897, he writes this wonderful book. I really love it, and I recommend it to you. It's called What is Art? What is Art? Where he asks that super basic question. What is this stuff? Why do we like it? Why do we seek it out? How does it hold so much power over us? And he's talking about every form of art, but most particularly his own form of art, story art. And this book contains what is, for my money, the best concise definition of art I've ever heard. And also, I think, one of the most provocative and one of the most dangerous. Uh, I think you guys will like this too. So here's how Tolstoy defines art. Art is, quote, an infection. Period. That's it. Full stop. Art is an infection, Tolstoy says. The whole point of art, he says, he ought to know is for me, the artist, to infect you, the audience, with my ideas and my emotions. This is not an innocent activity. The stronger my art, the better my art, the stronger the infection. The better job it will do of getting around your immunities and planting the virus. Whoa. Um, so this is a cool definition, and it's also a very forward-looking definition, because more than a century after Tolstoy's death, this is precisely what psychologists are finding in the lab. Let me give you a few examples of this research program in the sort of new science of storytelling that's kind of broken out maybe over the last 20 years. Uh, there's this neuroscientist named Paul Zak. I like this study. He brings a bunch of college students into his lab. Let me see if I have some bullet points for you. Uh, and he, it's important that they're college students because college students are poor. So he pays them $20 to read this sad, compelling, non-fictional story about a terminally ill little boy. The little boy's going to die, and it's about how his father is dealing with the grief process. It's really a very sad story. It takes a little blood from the student before they read, a little blood after they read, and at the end of the study, they have the option, the students do, to donate some or all of their money back to a charity that serves sick children. Okay? So the results of the study is that after reading the story, oxytocin levels in the blood spike. Oxytocin has been called the empathy chemical. And the more oxytocin there is in the student's blood, the more these cash-strapped, empathy-drunk students donate back to that charity that serves sick kids. On average, they gave back about half of their pay. They've done, they've done uh, Zach, the, the scientist, has done multiple versions of this, and people are always very generous in giving uh, to charity afterwards. What's important about this study, though, is that there's a control group. So Zach stresses, as do I, that the information about this sick child and the father has to be presented in a classical story structure. If he just sprays information at the students with bullet points about the sick kid and the grieving father, nothing happens. You do not get the chemical changes in the brain, you don't get the eruption of empathy, and you don't get the behavior change, which consists of people uh, giving some money away. So it's a cool study because it suggests that stories transform our attitudes, transform our behaviors, by actually kind of reaching through our skulls and modifying our brain chemistry. This is a purely, this one here, a purely lab-based study. What about stories operating in the real world? What about the sort of stories you guys are telling or aspire to tell on screen? There's quite a bit of research now showing that popular TV programs have the capacity to reorganize attitudes on a grand scale. So we have shows here like that, that research has been done on. Shows like Monk, Different Strokes, Will and Grace, 
the Canadian sitcom Little Mosque on the Prairie uh, have been shown to substantially, sharply in some cases, reduce bias against mentally ill people or African Americans or gay people or Muslims. Uh, it's very interesting, too, that the changes wrought by shows like this appear to be more powerful and more lasting than traditional approaches to prejudice reduction. Things like sensitivity training, which really haven't been shown uh, to work very well. So this all sounds pretty great. This is all the good news about stories. But if this guy were here, this is Plato, um, he'd be heckling me by now. He'd say, come on, get to the, uh, get to the butts. So, uh, and it's a good thing for you guys that he's not here because Plato famously uh, wanted to banish all the storytellers from his ideal society. So if Plato were standing up here and he had his way, he would liquidate this room. He'd drive you guys out into the wilderness, he'd burn your screenplays and, and your film reels. Um, why would he do such a thing? Well, Plato uh, felt that you guys are professional liars and that you, in his uh, language, nice phrase, cripple the mind by getting it drunk on emotion. He acknowledged that stories do good in the world. He didn't, he didn't deny this, but he thought that on average they wreak more havoc. Uh, Plato's Republic has been taken as the most ruthless insult against storytelling ever conceived by a great thinker. But I think it's exactly the opposite. This, this book is a great compliment to storytellers. It's an expression of his awe and his fear at this sort of spooky, mind-warping power that stories have over our minds. Now, we now know that Plato vastly underestimated stories' grip on our species. These instincts we have to tell stories are embedded deeply in our brains. The only way to banish them is like this. You know, you need a skull saw, you need a scalpel. There's no way to banish the storyteller. There's no way to banish storytelling from human life. But we shouldn't let the extreme nature of Plato's solu solution to the problem of storytelling blind us to the fact that there actually is a problem. I think we have a pretty enormous cultural blind spot when it comes to stories. We think they are weak when they're strong. We think they're frivolous when they're serious as hell. We think they are innocent when, as one scientist of stories puts it, nothing is less innocent than a story. Um, and now our technology, of course, as I'm trying to suggest in this slide, has made our stories more powerful, more ubiquitous, and more weaponizable than ever before. Stories do wreak quite a lot of havoc in the world. So, uh, I am a quasi-Platonist. I think stories are the best thing in the world. But I also think with Plato that they're the worst. So, to paraphrase Homer here, if story is the solution to all of our problems, I think it's also the cause of them. And uh, storytellers, you guys are, you know, uh, are storytellers with a potentially extraordinary cultural reach. Uh, this means that you have quite a lot of responsibility. I think the science is pretty well settled. You guys are not merchants of inert escapism. Uh, the stories you tell do shape minds. They do alter cultures. Um, there's, a, there's a case to be made that you guys are uh, primary forces in authoring the future. And so the only question becomes whether or not you guys and people like you will write us toward a brighter future or a darker one. Um, I'll be around for questions after, but let me just sum up with a couple of my favorite images of the storytelling animal in action. This is a famous picture. It's one of my favorite photographs of all time. 1947, Life Magazine. These are Kung San uh, Bushman. Uh, and this is simply called The Storyteller. And there's our guy right there in the center of the, center of the screen, right? 
He's a guy who's got his hands up in the air. I think he looks like a conductor. And I think that's appropriate because he's, he's orchestrating. He's orchestrating everything these people are thinking, everything they are feeling. He's in control of it. I love the way he's brought his people together here. He's drawn them together, mind up against mind, literally skin up against skin. I like these two little guys up here in the, uh, in the front. Um, he's brought his people into uh, hormonal harmony. He's brought them into neurological rhythm with each other. We'd be able to demonstrate this today in a lab. Um, and I don't have anything particularly uh, smart or scientific to say about this, except that I think this is quite wonderful that this, is, this happens to be the type of uh, creature that we evolved into. Uh, one more image from uh, another favorite image of the storytelling anim animal in action. These are storytelling animals in London uh, living during the Blitz. And they're living during this time of incredible fear and privation, a time of danger, war. And yet here they are, uh, picking through this library in search of, I guess, the solace of stories. Um, so that's enough for me. Uh, I, if, if there's time for a q and I'd be happy to answer as many questions as, as you have. Uh, thank you for listening to me. You can start us off if you want. Yes, yeah, somehow you answered your question because in the beginning you were referring to, to uh, narratives as fiction. And I just wanted to ask you if you, if you think this is always fiction because no. I disagree, yeah, but you, you do probably. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I sometimes have trouble, like in a 20 minute format, getting out all the clarifications that I should. And I was worried about that because I know not everyone here is a fiction storyteller. Um, so, no, I don't think. Uh, Story is synonymous with fiction uh, by any means. I think story is a way of uh, structuring information in a predictable way. And it doesn't matter if, those, if that information is invented and pretend or if it's based on uh, truth. Um, one of the things that's really impressive about stories, any, any type of story, any type of narrative, is that they hew uh, fairly slavishly to a grammar that uh, is, is fairly invariant across cultures and, uh, and, and across centuries, but I, I think you guys are mostly familiar with that work, so I won't go much deeper into that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. I, I think you did a really good job of kind of showing the whole history of storytelling and the images. It was very nice. Thank you. I have a question because we always talk about the golden age of television and how wonderful it is and how many stories are out there. Yeah. My question is, uh, is there a difference also, we also talk about television as being kind of addictive and we call it binging when we watch. Yeah. So my question is, uh, along, since television is also very, very profitable, uh, is there, are there also uh, kind of regimes being developed to heighten the uh, ways that uh, storytelling has now become also addictive? Mm. And is it possible that Rather that in some cases, the idea of, as you said, you know, that th there's a responsibility in telling a story. Yeah. Because you can really influence an audience. Right. That somehow, some, and sometimes because of the, the profit motive, that uh, that responsibility gets lost and it simply becomes hooking the audience. Uh, yeah, I love that way of talking, uh, of thinking about it. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that before. Uh, you said several things. Like I got stuck on the, the word binging. I hadn't thought about that before. But that's a sort of pejorative word, and it's associated with uh, abuse of substances. So it, so it ties in nicely with my... I'm, I'm tempted to call it a drug analogy, but I don't really think of it as a drug analogy. Um, story... I, I, I'm sort of uh, researching this right now, uh, so I don't have uh, nice little formulations for it yet, but I think... There are ways of altering consciousness that do not involve chemical substances. The classic definition of a drug is you ingest a chemical substance that alters your state of consciousness. But there are ways of altering the states of consciousness um, that do not involve uh, the taking of drugs. And I, so I, I think a story of, as fairly literally as a drug. I think we take it for the same reason. We take other drugs as a sort of escape from our drudgery, our loneliness, our meaninglessness. 
um, and it has you know predictable uh, effects on our minds that we enjoy and we seek out and we take refuge in. Uh, so I, th I love this idea of, of binging, and I'll, I'll, I'll spend some time thinking about that. Thank you for that. Uh -huh. How do you think about the whole fake news situation? Like, uh, it's like the news phrase that, you, that is called out like all the time, and yeah. a lot of times you will see things like on, the, on Facebook, but also in these regular news uh, sites, that a story you know, is, is, is like so good would rather just share it yes. than they would check the facts. Yes, yes. So I think that's, you, that's great. What are your thoughts about that? Um, something like what you just said. I think, I think, it's, I think it's interesting that um, we may... One of the things that, is, that I've been toying with is this question. Are, are our minds organized to seek truth or are they organized to pay attention to whatever happens to make the best story? Are we organized to pay attention to what's important, like global warming, or are we organized to pay attention to what happens to make the best story, like the Kardashians? <laughs> you know? And if that's true, then we will be systematically biased toward paying attention as a species to things that may not matter very much, but just happen to click into uh, a story structure that our, our brains are very receptive to. And I think this is one of the things that, that Plato is concerned about. So Plato is saying, listen, I'm not being a buzzkill. I'm not uh, a Philistine. I go to a play, and I enjoy it just as much as you do. But I recognize that the way the playwrights are writing these plays is to distort them in ways that are designed for a profit motive, to bring in audience, and, and, and it might be good for the teller, but isn't necessarily good for the society. Because in Plato's view, these stories were full of all sorts of immoral uh, and obj objectionable um, lessons. Yeah, so the whole, um, this, this ties into the, the fiction versus nonfiction thing too. The whole fake news phenomenon, this whole post-truth phenomenon is definitely something that I'm thinking a lot about these days. Because if we are moving into a post-truth world, um, and I think to some extent it's kind of undeniable that we are, because we may insist that we have the truth, but there's 50% of the population is on the other side insisting that they have the truth, and our truths don't jive. So who knows if you're living in the true world or the, or the fake world. And so if we're, not living, if, if we're in a post-truth world, where are we? We are in story world. And that's where we're going to be uh, for the foreseeable future, it seems. And that's scary. That's scary. Yeah. Yeah. What difference do you make between the story based on the and the story based on visual and the story made on visual words? I tend to focus on what unites different uh, modes of storytelling. Um, so that, that's what interests me the most. That, what, what interests me the most is this sort of grammar of storytelling that unites not just different genres and modes, but different cultures, different societies uh, throughout history. Um, one of the things that has impressed me most in my research is how predictable stories are of all kinds. Um, so we all think of stories as this sort of wildly creative art form, and in many ways it is. But no matter where you go in the world, no matter when you go there, you always find the people tell, and you're doing work on rock art, and I'm sure that the, the, the grammar of the stories is the same. What, what, what is a story? Um, stories, again, many people have tried to define this, many scholars, many scientists, I'm sure uh, many practitioners in your fields have tried, but for me, if you sweat story down to the bones, what is it? A story always has a character, character's got a problem, character tries to solve it, a story, it's a problem solution structure. There may, there may be more to a story than that. You can add things, but I think without the problem solution structure, you don't have something that most people in the world would recognize as a story, or at least a story they want to attend to. And yeah, you can always think of counter examples to this rule. I know you guys are a very educated audience, no problem. You'll come up with counter examples to the rule. 
But these are going to be exceptions to prove the rule. Usually by writers, filmmakers who noticed this grammar and said, I'm not going to be caught in this prison anymore. I'm going to bust my way out. And reliably, no one likes these stories. People read them. People watch them. But usually only because their professor forced them uh, to, to read this book. You know, it doesn't draw a big audience. And this is in that, in that grammar of storytelling, that simple, simple problem solution grammar, usually with some sort of moral uh, question hanging in the balance, um, is uh, remarkably uniform across cultures and across societies. And in some way, you might think, well, of course, of course, we all knew this. Everyone knows this. This is the most basic thing I learned in film school. Uh, 101, there has to be a conflict, there has to be some sort of problem or trouble. But if you think about it from another point of view, it's not one bit obvious that stories ought to be this way. Many of us might have expected to find traditions where stories really did function as like escape pods into some hedonistic paradise. You go into this fantasy land, everything's great, there's no suffering and you get to have this virtual reality simulation of a world where everything's wonderful. And that is so not what you find in stories. Stories are hell worlds much more than heaven worlds. Even the lightest sorts of comedies, you know, they might end happily, but only after the characters have been sufficiently tortured. And this is just kind of an interesting uh, thing about stories, an interesting, reliable feature that we find in stories that uh, needs a solution. It's a sort of puzzling, um, it's, it's obvious in one way, but if you think about it, it's, it's, it's not really obvious that it ought to be that way. Oh, let's see if there's any hands. Yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I like very much what you said, because that's in fact the point when you look at stories, it's far from being obvious to, to design uh, information in this way. Yeah. But um, anyway, I just... Uh, yeah, I'm just amazed by your words. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. you. <laughs> but uh, uh, one question, just out of curiosity, um, I, I'm doing a bit of research in how stories evolve and change, even if they're basically all the time the same. But I would yeah. say because you were, you were referring to this set uh, story example, yeah, that we somehow we don't find the set set stories anymore. I would say. Like the 60s, yeah. In the 70s, there was this new genre in that to feel good, yeah. Yeah. Before it was tragedy, of course. In the 19th century, most of the stories had bad endings, and you had to cry and so on. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be quality, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me we're trying to avoid in the last years uh, so-called bad feelings, let's say. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Do you guys think that's true? No. Is, is that true? But I, th I think it's definitely true of the, bo of the big screen. Yeah, yeah. Where they've gone to, to blockbusters and superheroes, but I'm not sure if it's true of Netflix and HBO and. No, I completely disagree. But we can discuss True in animation. Ah. Oh really? Really? But they're still facing their little challenges. Yeah. yeah. Nothing too scary, yeah. Not like the Grimm's fairy tales or something like this. I have this whole fairy tale quoted in this book, and the fairy tale is, is called, uh, it's a Grimm's fairy tale. This is what used to be told to children. This story is called, How the Children Played Butcher with Each Other. And it's, you know, one little, one little boy butchers up his sister and his other brother, and, you know, it's just, and it's, it's amazing. It's amazing because, of course, it, you know, yeah. You know, by far the most popular genre in young adults is apocalyptic stories. Right. And in YA, yeah. People are really talking about, well, why is that so? Yeah. You have a generation that no longer believes they're going to uh, succeed. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think, I think there's a... I don't know. I think... Still, I think how, how young are the children you're talking about? Yeah, because it's kind of interesting. I think with kids that age, the real audience is the parents. They're the ones turning on the TV. They're the ones setting up the Netflix. And the parents want sanitized stories. The kids don't want those stories. The kids would much rather have uh, the YA stuff. I remember reading to my daughter um, 
my other daughter, who's not here, um, of, of an Indian fairy tale. So I had this whole book of Native American uh, fairy tales, for, and they were sort of for, for children, um, but they were really dark. And at some point, I was just like, oh, this is too much. And I start sort of censoring it as I read. And my daughter knew I was doing it because I'd already read it the right way the first time. <laughs> and she uh, objected. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's all about death and misery and horrifying stuff. And she's like, Dad, I love death. Um, but what, what I think she meant by that was, uh, I find this fascinating. Uh, I know this thing lurks out there. No one will tell me about it. And uh, this story finally is giving me some sort of insight into this, some sort of window in this, and you keep pulling the shade down. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then once kids get a little more control of their own reading material, you find them gravitating into dark stuff just like, uh, peop like their parents like, uh, the, the apocalyptic stuff, um, all the rest of it, you yeah. know. Yes, I'd like to go back to um, your picture of the Sam Bushman listening to the storyteller. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's do that. Because uh, you mentioned Plato and the, the fact that storytelling can be a benefits or a distraction or a manipulative story. What we know is that truly uh, we are submerged with dreams and images and stories in our head that suddenly somebody taking in charge one way of telling one story is actually relaxing. Mm -hmm. And that is what we see here. Mm -hmm. But I've heard the same things like Plato and spiritual leaders saying you should not read books, you should not watch TV, it's not good. And yeah. when I went into meditation in India, I was ordered to try to have no thoughts at all. Yes. And make a complete emptiness. Yeah. But then you can install a story inside that you control and mm -hmm. not influenced by. So it's always polemical, but it, as you mentioned, it's the way we are and we were built, yeah. evolved. And uh, we're all fascinated by that because if not, we wouldn't be here, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. telling stories. To right. People are, are seeing stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's yeah. We're stuck with it. Um, Plato has this interesting thing where, by the way, almost everyone knows that much about the Republic that Plato tried to banish all the storytellers. It's a much more subtle read than that. You know, you should be skeptical. Could he have really believed such a dumb thing? Could he have really believed it was possible? And he may have, but he might he might not have. Um, so he, 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 these are Socratic dialogues, they're back and forth. So Plato will say, hey, let's banish the storytellers. And his interlocutors will say, hey, uh, Socrates, is this really actually possible? And Socrates will say, well, you know, I just don't know, but I think it would be better if we could do it this way. And here's, here's what he says is his secondary solution. So if I can't banish them all, or if I can't banish them this year and I have to wait a hundred years to do so, what do I do in the meantime? And this is his solution. Even though he loves stories, he's going to sit there in the back of the theater. He's still going to go to the theater. But the whole time that the actors are up on stage acting out the story, what he's going to do is in his head, he's going to chant a magic spell. He's going to be going, la, 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 and tuning them out. He's not really saying la 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 though. What he's saying is he's rehearsing in his head all the arguments he's made in this book as a counter charm against the magic of the storytellers, as a way to hold on to his own sanity and his own rationality and his own mind to keep them out of his head, to keep them from manipulating his brain chemistry, uh, to maintain control of his perfect rationality. Um, and it is such a pathetic solution. It will never work. Go ahead and try it. Within like a minute or two, the storyteller's going to win, and he's going to forget about saying la, 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 la. And I think I'll be around after if anybody wants to say anything more, but, but I'm getting a look from the organizer to say, to say it's time to go. Thank you very much.